A very good afternoon to all of you. So this is the second lecture on dedicated to heavy ion physics. So and it is dedicated to relativistic hydrodynamics. It's a very big topic and it's a complete detour to what we are discussing here today. So I would like to because I'm also not a theoretical expert in relativistic hydrodynamics. So the plan here is to give you the flavor of hydrodynamic evolution in heavy ion collisions and see how experimental signatures agree to theoretical predictions. Okay, so we'll discuss two or three predictions given by ideal hydrodynamics, ideal inviscid hydrodynamics. So we are not talking about any viscosity or dissipative loss and see how it fares with the experimental measurements. So it will, the talk will comprise of thermodynamics followed by relativistic hydrodynamics. So remember when we discussed about the heavy ion collisions yesterday, so I didn't talk about the motivation of doing that at RIC or LHC because yesterday uh, we were concentrating on this um factor of A collisions and then we talked about this initial conditions which we can take into account when we do EA collisions. Now this is a schematic of heavy ion collisions where we collide two ultra relativistic ions, they're highly Lorentz contracted and you can assume any initial conditions. So and then they interact and then in the process what they do, they deposit a significant amount of their kinetic energy as they pass through each other and this creates a very high density and in the process the matter or the confined matter becomes deconfined and once they interact with each other they form a state known as the deconfined state of matter known as coagulone plasma but we do not know yet whether that is thermodynamically equilibrated or not the assumption is that it is near to thermal equilibration and subsequently it evolves hadronizes and then we detect them at our detectors. And why this is interesting or why we are pursuing this? Because this deconfined state is expected, was expected to be there after a few microseconds of the Big Bang. So if we study the evolution of this exotic or let's say elusive state, it can give us information about how our universe, uh, let's say, evolved. But the second priority is also that this is a state of partons at very high density and temperature. So it also allows us to study QCD in nuclear environment. Okay, that is also one of the important goals of doing heavy ion collisions. So this is the experimental setup. So yesterday we discussed about the initial state. Now the question is how the matter evolves with time. Now this is a very difficult question because as users or as experimentalists what we get at the user end are a bunch of particles, their momentum information. But by the time we get that information they are non-interacting and the particles are relatively cold compared to what we had at initial stages. And what we have to do is that with, that, with those bunch of particles and their kinematic informations, we have to understand what has happened in the very initial stages. And on top of that, if we want to, uh, let's say, know about the properties, thermodynamic properties of that exotic state of matter, and once it evolves, it transport properties, so it really becomes a very daunting task and it's not easy. Okay. So here we, we would like to study how the matter evolves with time, taking a very simplistic picture. 
So namely, we'll try to see what would be the equation of state, temperature, density, lifetime, etc. And see whether our assumption of this evolution dynamics agrees well with the experimental data. So once we model something, we have to see also whether the consequences or the implications of that model are realistic or not. Okay. So here, okay. So as I mentioned, it's not an easy task. So, but we have multitude of particles at our user n. So once we have a large number of particles, we would like to use, you know, thermodynamics or statistical physics to describe them. But this is an evolution starting from initial stage to final state. So we need a model which can describe this evolution. And what has been observed that fluid dynamics, because when something flows, so the natural thing, what comes to our mind, it, it, it will be like a fluid. So what is a fluid? So fluid is a continuous system, which is at every point. So ev at every infinitesimal volume of that fluid, it is thermally equilibrated. Okay. So when we want to apply fluid dynamics to this system, so it is simple and general because it is simple because the properties. So when we apply fluid dynamics, uh, it is simple because the properties of the system which we want to describe is encoded in its thermodynamic behavior. That's true. And second thing is that we only have one assumption that it has to be, it has to be in thermal equilibrium. We are not interested what are its constituents, how they interact, what are, what are the field interactions, whether they are bosons or fermions, whether that interaction is quantum mechanic or classical, we are least bothered in fluid dynamics, we are not bothered about this microscopic details, but what we need that our system should be in thermal equilibrium, okay. It's a strong assumption, but that's how we need to study the evolution. So here also we'll imagine or let's say we'll assume that the system which was produced in the initial stages is thermally equilibrated or maybe the particles interact so much among themselves that they achieve near thermal equilibrium. So that would be an assumption and then we proceed, okay. So let's start, let's divide this lecture into two parts because we need to have the equation of state. So we have to know the thermodynamic properties and later we see how it evolves, okay. So what is thermodynamics? So at uh, the very layman language, it really, it's, uh, it's really a way to, let's say, gauge the macroscopic properties of the system. So, and also here, it, uh, it really doesn't bother about the microscopic constituents. So, only thing is that we are bothered about is that it gives the description of the micros macroscopic variables such as pressure, volume, energy density and all that. So, it basically gives you the average uh, quantities or average measurements of these variables once we try to describe the system and it is applicable when the system is at rest and it is at global equilibrium. So when I say global equilibrium that means the intensive quantities like a pressure, density, all those things they do not change and the entropy for a thermally equilibrated system is constant. Okay. So those are all encoded in our, uh, let's say, zeroth law or the first, second and third. So zeroth law gives us the definition of the temperature and the first law gives about the energy conservation. So what it says that a change in the internal energy of the thermodynamic system is given by this. This is what we all know. So this first term refers to the uh, mechanical work done on the system. And this is the delta Q or the heat energy and it is an internal uh, degree of the system which is described by the entropy because we know that heat cannot be a state variable while entropy is a state variable and then temperature becomes that constant. And then we have an additional thing, let's say third term is mu dn 
which takes care of the conservation of number of particles. Okay. So, what it says that the internal energy of a system can change due to the change due to the change in its if a mechanical work is done in the system or there is the change in the heat energy of the system or there can be change in the number of constituents of the system. Okay. And these are the usual variables which we know. And since energy is an extensive function of these variables because this volume, entropy and number these are all extensive variables, we know that. So, we can write this, we can simply write this internal energy in this way and if we differentiate with respect to lambda, if you differentiate u with respect to lambda and then use this equation, okay, you can get u is equal to minus PV plus TS plus mu n. This is the Euler's relation and this is very basic thermodynamics which all of us have studied in our college days, right? So then <coughs> once you get this equation and combining the information for the change in internal energy, so you can also get the Gibbs to him relation which relates the change in pressure with the change in temperature and change in the chemical potential. Okay. So, these are very important relations which we are going to use. Now, if you remember in thermodynamics or also in fluid dynamics, it is better to express things in terms of densities. Density means if I have energy, it is better to use in terms of density that is scale it by volume so that u by v becomes E energy density and then S by V becomes small s which is the entropy density and N by V becomes N, it is the number density. Now why expressing in terms of density is important? Because then all these small e, s and N becomes intensive variables, okay. So in thermodynamic equilibrium they do not change and they describe your system also, okay. So, it is better to express in terms of densities and with some manipulation of this, we also can express the change in pressure in terms of entropy density and number density. So, this is nothing special, this is this you can find in any standard thermodynamics book, but we will need it to understand our evolution. Now, starting from here, so if I want to see this small change in energy density, I can see that it is related to small change in entropy as well as in the number density. Now remember when I started that we want to use fluid dynamics for the evolution of our system and the system and the very assumption is that the system is in thermal equilibrium, so it has to be isoentropic because the entropy does not change for a system in thermal equilibrium and if that is so that only and similarly the number will not change because entropy depends on the number, the volume changes. So, we can write this relation and with this modification we can arrive at this relation. Now, this is just for usage at a later stage, okay. So, then we will imagine the system which we are studying as similar to a classical ideal gas, uh, sorry, gas and it is an oversimplification of what we are doing. So, let us assume that they are made up of independent identical particles and the ensemble or the system is described by a grand canonical ensemble. So, that is our assumption and once you have grand canonical ensemble, so then you can fetch all these quantities, number density, energy density and pressure from the partition function and it looks like this. Another assumption what I have taken is that, so I have used the Boltzmann factor instead of let us say fermionic or bosonic factor because at large temperature and in classical limit you can treat your bosons and fermions as Boltzmann particles. So, therefore, you have the Boltzmann factor everywhere, okay. Now, from these interactions or let us say from these relations, you can easily see that P is equal to NT and it is nothing but your ideal gas relation. You can easily calculate from the previous relations 
and here this is the let's say kinetic pressure and you can see that you can really equate this and here this pressure to get the ideal gas relation and this is what we are also assuming our system to be and then you have p p depending on the initial energy density and you have expressions for number density and energy density also and from these relations and previous you can say that entropy density also is four times of the number density so these are all equation of states which we require for our system okay and this is nothing special this is all standard textbook now once our equation of states are fixed now let's come to the evolution part or let's come to the fluid part so as i mentioned earlier the only assumption what we are taking is local thermodynamic equilibrium here i have written local because we don't know whether the global thermodynamic equilibrium has been achieved and the assumption here is also that pressure and temperature vary so slowly that for any point one can assume thermodynamic equilibrium in some in some of the neighborhood of the fluid particle and the second assumption which is true for any fluid is that mean free mean free path of the particle between two collision is much smaller than the characteristic dimension of the system and it is isotropic okay so these three are these three assumptions are used to let's say used to evolve the system from its position okay now the two things also what we have to uh, worry yeah so so once our fluid is defined the conditions of the fluid are defined then let's define two frames one is the fluid rest frame so the rest frame of a fluid element is the frame in which its momentum vanishes and remember all our densities all our thermodynamic quantities namely the energy densities entropy densities number densities everything is defined in this rest frame okay and since it is in local thermodynamic equilibrium the fluid element has also isotropic properties in the fluid rest frame and we'll see that how this is important okay next thing is that here it is the it is in the fluid rest frame but we know that our system will evolve it will travel or let's say it will evolve to its final state and it will have a velocity so then we imagine the fluid elements having the velocity v and it is so we can take two or three types of assumption so here the thing is that when we define velocity of for the fluid element it is actually the velocity of the rest frame of the fluid element okay so it started with the rest and if you want to give a velocity to our fluid then it's actually the velocity of the rest frame all the fluid uh, particles are traveling with the same velocity v and this is how we define that okay so this is a relativistic fluid so you have the and this u0 also becomes the lorentz contraction factor okay so this is and the second thing is baryon number conservation okay so for non relativistic fluid you are all aware of the continuity equation where it is the mass density and it is the flux okay so this is for a non relativistic fluid now when we have because this is a relativistic fluid then your n because now your mass density will be replaced by number density so why we are writing here baryon number conservation because if you see in our original thermodynamic equations that refers to the conservation of the num or let's say it refers to the number of particle conservation but here as we are dealing with relativistic particles they can also have energy when you can create two particles and they can annihilate and all that so if that is happening that the number conservation doesn't make any sense so you have to look for quantities which are conserved or numbers which are conserved so you can have baryon number isospin charge or whatever depending on so since our particles are quarks so you can have three sort of conservation numbers 
So here we are only worried about the baryon number conservation. If you want to add other conservations, so in the mu dn you can add uh, more terms. So here we are only bothered about baryon number conservation and it also makes sense because although when the collision happened you had an excess of baryons because you had protons and neutrons but those are so very energetic uh, collisions that once your particles are produced from the initial colliding nuclei you see that the baryon number conservation is valid and this is what we are going also we are going to assume for our fluid also. So this is the continuity equation, the general equation for any fluid and for our relativistic fluid this boils down to this. Okay. Now number, after number conservation next important thing for any fluid evolution is the energy momentum conservation and because of the so these are the energy momentum tensors and you can see that this row this refers to the energy density and here all the so in the rest frame it is all zero because coming from the constraints of the isotropy but we know our fluid is moving so the this column actually refers to the density or let us say the flux of the energy in this momentum direction and this refers to the density of momentum along the three directions. Now once we have a moving fluid you can see that these are populated like this and you have a velocity component. Now what we also see that the symmetry of the tensor is preserved once we go from the rest frame to the moving frame. So these equations can be nicely condensed to be written in this form. It's quite elegant also. So this is the energy momentum tensor for any arbitrary fluid with a velocity v. Okay. Now if this is true, the conservation of energy momentum tensor would yield you this equation. Okay. So this is the conservation of energy and momentum and this is, I mean, the, this is the energy momentum tensor and the conservation can be written like this. So we have two equations, so we have now equations of state coming from thermodynamics and these are the relativistic hydrodynamics equation coming from the conservation of energy and momentum and also conservation of, let us say, baryon number. So all these five equations, namely all the equations of state, namely the expressions for pressure, energy density, number density, entropy density, those are all equations of state and these conservation laws coming from, let us say, from the evolution of the fluid, namely the conservation of, let us say, a typical continuity equation in terms of the number density and the conservation of energy momentum gives us the fluid equations and these five or six equations, they form a closed group of equations which we can use to describe our evolving fluid. Okay. So this is simple, but let us see whether it really uh, explains our data or not. So the first test would be see that we know that how the way we define sound, the sound is always defined as a small disturbance in a uniform fluid. Okay. That is a typical definition of sound from our let us say textbook definition. Now this is a uniform fluid which we have defined, it is a classical uniform fluid, uh, sorry it is a relativistic uniform fluid. So if we add a disturbance, let us say the disturbance or the perturbation, it can be written as epsilon 0 and this delta E is the perturbation. Okay. So the fluid is described in terms of energy density and let us say pressure. If you add a small perturbation, then it can and then that you can write that as epsilon 0 which is the value in the uniform fluid and this delta epsilon is the small perturbation. Similarly for the pressure also you can add P0 plus delta P. Okay. Now the evolution of the perturbation. Now we know that sound is a small disturbance propagating in the uniform fluid. So you have created this disturbance and let us see when, whether you are getting the velocity of sound or more importantly whether you are getting the equations of the sound wave. Okay. So now this evolution of the disturbance can be studied by your let us say 
this evolution equation because this will give you evolution in both time and space coordinates. So for energy density, this, this tensor you can write in terms of this and also you have the pressure part where it is E plus O. If you go back to the notation here for the moving fluid, just you can pick that and you can write this in. So you get two equations, one in terms of the, uh, let's say this momentum flux and one in terms of this. Now if we see this equation, you can later realize that these are very fundamental equations. So we'll just modify a bit. Now you just substitute, let's say for E, you can substitute this, okay. And for P, you can substitute this. And if we do that, you are getting something like that. Okay, so these calculations you can do, they are not difficult at all. So when you do this, so can you relate it, these two equations? So what is the first equation? What does it tell you? So first term plus this is 0 and delta V is the divergence term, correct? So if this divergence is positive or let's say, so then your energy density with time has to decrease, right? So more or less it defines or this expression defines the conservation of energy, correct? Now the second, second equation, can you relate it to the Newton's second law? So because this is an acceleration term, correct? And this would be your inertia, correct? So mass into acceleration or inertia times acceleration will give you force. So minus del delta, the, let's say the gradient of this delta P is like your force but force, but force per unit volume, correct? Because this is pressure which is force per unit area and here you have a sign, so it is force per unit volume, that means it is forcing the fluid to go to low pressure. So this is energy conservation, this is your second law of motion and from here, if we define the speed of sound as del P by del epsilon, this is how it is defined. And if you calculate this from your previous relationship, you can get that your speed of sound can be expressed in terms of this. And this is for a baryonless fluid because we are taking dn to be zero here. Now if you just plug in all the things here, so you can get the wave equation in 3 plus 1 dimension for a ideal relativistic fluid. And this equations show that small perturbations in a uniform fluid travel at the velocity of a sound. So the way we approximated our fluid as an ideal relativistic fluid, which is completely equilibrated, we see that we are getting the <coughs> equation that shows that if you do a small perturbation, so it's an equation which shows the evolution of the perturbation and it shows that it travels with the velocity of sound. So all is good here. So now let's come to the hydrodynamical expansion which we are interested in. So this is the part which we are interested in. So you have, let's say, <coughs> so then we have to again resort it to many assumptions and we have to also take care of different coordinate system. So let us assume that all the particles, so let the collision happen at Z because they are traveling uh, the, uh, they are colliding along the beam axis and let the beam axis be in the z direction. So let us assume, let us, uh, let us assume that the collision happens at z and t is equal to 0. And, <coughs> and the second assumption what we have to take is that the longitudinal motion is uniform. So that the velocity which is vz by t for all particles generated here are same, okay, that is the Vz, okay. Then we'll also do a sort of define new coordinate system which are boost invariant. So they are also known as Milne coordinates and the transformation is this. 
So if we do that, we define a proper time, proper time in, in terms of let's say eta s and the rapidity. This is the space-time rapidity and this is the fluid rapidity. So if we do that, the advantage, advantages are because in under Lorentz boost in the z direction because they're colliding at the beam and because the collision is happening along the z directions. So tau remains unchanged while these eta s and y they really transform by a constant. Okay, they just shift get shifted by a constant. So the initial conditions are not z is equal to zero or t is equal to zero. Now it is tau is called the proper time is happens at the collision happens at some proper time is equal to tau zero. And then if you put that condition, you can also see that space time rapidity is equal to the fluid rapidity. So this would be our initial conditions. So whenever a fluid has to evolve, you have to give those initial conditions. So the conditions regarding the space time variables are given. Now the next is what about its entropy or the energy density distribution. Since the number density, if we go to the equation of states, we have seen that uh, the entropy density is related to, it's equal to 4n, which is related to number density. So let us assume that the entropy density has a simple Gaussian form. And here, your coordinates are what? Those are tau, proper time, x, y, and z is replaced by your eta. So those are the coordinates. So the Gaussian distribution in those coordinates looks like this. And this is a very simplistic assumption because if you remember when we discussed about the thickness function, because that number density will depend upon how your collision has happened at what impact parameter. So that will decide the number density. So, and your entropy depends upon that number density. So instead of defining number density, it is convenient to uh, define entropy density. People also uh, can give number density and can see the evolution. But here it is important because we are worried about the isoentropicity of the evolution. So it's better to give entropy density so that our calculations becomes easier. Okay. So all the initial conditions are given. Now the fluid has to evolve. So now, so once your fluid is defined both in terms of its thermodynamic property, equation of states and the fluid equations. Now we have to see what we, uh, what is expected from this, uh, let's say evolving fluid. Okay. So the idea is that now the collision has happened and you are imagining the evolution to be completely in sync with the evolution of a relativistic fluid. But then you have to see that at some point of time, those let's say fluid element has to convert into hadrons because ultimately we are measuring hadrons and when we want to compare our production, uh, let's say predictions of this theory, we have to compare it with the distributions of the observed hadrons, okay. So if we do so, so you have to imagine or you have to assume that the evolution of the fluid even if a phase transition or some transition has happened where the fluid element got converted into hadrons, the, this, these all initial conditions like having the same Vz, having similar entropy, everything is obeyed till the final end where the fluid got converted to hadron so that the footprints are visible in the hadronic observables. Now let us see if that happens or not. Now let's start with the longitudinal acceleration. Okay, so the initial assumption was Vz is constant for all the particles. That was our assumption. And let's see how the Vz evolves. All the Vz is equal to zero in the fluid rest frame. So if we see the evolution and Vx, Vy were anyway zero. So we are not worried about them at now. So, okay. So now let's take how the Vz evolves or what is the longitudinal acceleration because initially this longitudinal component of the momentum is important for us. Now just plugging in the fluid evolution equation, we can see that we are getting a relation like this. Okay. Now what does it signify? So you are getting del Vz by del T 
is equal to minus c s square which is a constant and it is it can be expressed as a differential of log of entropy density with respect to the z coordinate. Since we are using proper coordinates, it's better to express in that coordinate. So your t becomes tau and your vz is your fluid rapidity, which is for the initial condition, which is also equal to the space time rapidity. But let's say whether that is preserved after evolution because that those were the initial conditions. Okay. So now del y by del tau is given by this. Okay. Now suppose you assume that y is equal to eta s. That thing is obeyed till the end of the fluid evolution. So what should you expect? So if y has to be equal to let's say eta s, that was our initial condition and if we assume that that has to be obeyed till the evolution, so what should be the distribution of eta s because that is, uh, so eta s can be assumed to be equivalent to what we are observing as the particle rapidity or pseudo rapidity. So from this equation, if that has to be assumed, then you have to, so can you tell from this, this is the second part which, which is like if you really do the calculations you are getting, you are not getting y fluid rapidity to be equal to eta s, but it is like, it is dependent on eta s by a constant fraction, that is okay. But if the initial condition has to be satisfied, suppose instead of, this is the very realistic calculation, so you take s, you know the form of s, you just differentiate and you, you will get this value of tau after integrating from 0 to tau. This is what we actually get. But this is not equal here, y is not equal to eta s. So this is not obeying your initial condition because that is also an assumption. This is a more realistic scenario. But if you see that whether y tau is, let's say, eta s, you don't get this factor, then what should you observe experimentally? So if that is the scenario, that means del s by del eta s should be 0 and if that is true, that means your sigma eta should be more or less infinity, correct? So that means you will have a flat distribution. Now if you, be, if you make sigma eta square quite large, then your Gaussian will turn to be a flat distribution. That is what you are expecting from the assumptions, okay. So either you get this eta s plus some constant shifted by some constant and for ideal case, if you are still believing that y is equal to eta s, the initial condition is still preserved till the end of the evolution, you should expect a flat rapidity distribution for the observed particles, okay. So that is our expectation from the fluid dynamics. Now let's see experimentally what we observe, okay. So this is the rapidity spectrum of let's say final particles in let's say this is an example of gold gold collisions at RIC at three different energies and it is the rapidity distribution of the final state charged particles and left right hand side shows the same for let's say lead lead collisions at let's say 2.76 TeV and this is the eta distribution of the final particles. But what you see that this is not exactly flat, okay. For some region of eta one can imagine this to be flat, but you see that these distributions are not flat. So that means for the, these regions and uh, there is a diff for certain condition because of the relationship between y and uh, pseudo, between rapidity and pseudo rapidity, but one can treat this regions as flat regions, but here it can't be really uh, called as a uniform distribution. And the reasons are that all, although we are having this longitudinal, uh, let's say, acceleration, but we are forgetting about the transverse expansion which also plays an important role and really it cuts down the effect of longitudinal acceleration. Now let's see if you are talking about the transverse expansion. So let's see how 
the onset happens. So remember the Vx and Vy which will give you the transverse, um, transverse part of the expansion. So initially Vx and Vy were 0. But let's see how the acceleration terms come comes out to be. So if Vx by, so if you can use the similar equation, so you get expression like this, you know what is your S. So if you calculate your Vx and Vy comes out to be C, Cx square x by sigma x square t and Cx square y by into t by sigma y square. So that depends upon these values, okay. Now in non-central collisions, okay, so you, where the overlap is not complete, so you can see that sigma x is smaller than sigma y. So in that case, your vx square, okay, so if you see the relation, it will be greater than vy square. So there is an asymmetry here already developing, okay. And this is specifically for non-central collision because it is manifested more due to the geometry of the collision. Now, if this is true, so your particle emission or you will be, you will get more particles in the direction where the phi is equivalent to 0 or pi and you will have less particles emitted because there will be a momentum anisotropy due to this and you will have less particles in the direction of plus minus pi by 2. So, this expectation can be quantified in the Fourier decomposition of the particles in terms of uh, let's say azimuthal angle. So this can be quantified like this. But this is a theoretical prediction and if you see this behavior in experimental data that also gives a strong evidence of transverse expansion. But let's see whether we are seeing that in real data or not. So the next thing what we are, which is a pointer to, when it's a pointer to means it's a hint of what you should observe in heavy ion collisions. One is the transfer spectra. Transfer spectra refers to the momentum distribution of outgoing particles. And it is the transverse momentum distribution because initially the we only had longitudinal component. So whatever transverse component we are getting that would be by virtue of the collisions. So therefore transverse momentum spectra is important. And as I mentioned earlier that at some point of time the fluid component gets converted to hadrons and that cannot be described by fluid dynamics. But one has to assume that the properties of the fluid till the late state of evolution got transferred into the final state and if that is so, then your momentum distributions can be given by Boltzmann statistics because that was the equation of state which defined your, uh, let's say, fluid. So then you can see, you can really parameterize your momentum spectra or the transverse momentum here in this case momentum spectra in terms of Boltzmann statistics. Now let's say whether we are seeing that or not, okay. So let's start with our central collisions, the collisions where the overlap is, let's say it's a complete overlap, so you have maximum number of participants. So if go back to this expression, okay. So, and also you have in central collisions, you have rotational symmetry because you have a complete overlap, so you don't have any preferred direction. So, if you use rotational symmetry, you can really write your P, you can really transform in terms of transverse momenta and the Z component, okay. If you write this and you express your E, energy in terms of this because that's what our energy is. So now let's see two conditions, okay. One is if the fluid was at rest, okay. So this is the particle spectra, okay. So now we want to quantify or we want to see whether our particle spectrum is behaving as per the expectations of fluid dynamics. Now try to see, suppose, go back to the fluid rest frame, supposedly your fluid was at rest, so then your spectrum is really exponential in empty. That all of you can see, correct? Because then this terms become zero, so you don't have the second term. So if you see the 
empty spectra, you can always convert this to empty. So, if the fluid is at rest, supposedly the fluid which was formed was at rest, the spectrum is exponential in empty with the same slope because 1 by t would be the slope for all the particles. Now, this is a very strong statement coming from relativistic fluid dynamics that for um, let us say for if the fluid is at rest, let us say let us take an example of let us say PP collisions, more basic collisions where we do not expect any flowing fluid or revolving matter. In that case, we can see that the spare particle spectrum can be quantified with this expression and majorly we will see that this is 1 by t for all particles because irrespective of the masses of the particle, the slope of the transverse momentum spectra would be similar. Now, this is a strong prediction coming from theory. Now, let us see what the measurements tell us. Okay. So, this is a measurement by let us say star experiment. It is one of the very early measurements showing strong evidence of what we are going to see. So, the upper part refers to gold gold collisions the collisions in which we are interested. So, let us not focus here, but the bottom part refers to PP collisions, okay, both at same center of mass energy. And we have three panels dedicated to pions, kaons and protons. So, these particles significantly differ in their masses. And what it predicts that if the fluid is at rest, we do not have an evolving or moving fluid, then all the particles irrespective of their mass will have same slope. Okay. So, now it is difficult uh, in this plot to compare. So, let us go to this plot where it is the exact data, but for PP collisions. Okay. We will also uh, come, we will also see what happens in case of heavy ion collisions. So, they have taken these three points and they superimpose on them. So, if you see all three distributions are parallel to each other, more or less they are all parallel to each other that shows that they have the same slope, right? They have the same slope. So, but we have some differences here in terms of like you have a little difference between proton and antiproton that says that okay, it is not completely baryon less fluid which we assumed for our evolution and then, then if you extrapolate this pi on spectra here, you will see that protons lie a bit higher, but that you can understand from this uh, let us say factor because this um, protons have a spin of half while pi ions have 0. So, you can explain those things and k ions they lie li bit, little bit lower than uh, let us say pions because those are strange particles. So, they are not produced, uh, they are not produced in large amounts let us say in PP collision. But the thing is that all of these have same slope. Okay. Now, let us see what happens in gold gold, it is the same data now see for gold gold collisions. Okay. So, this is pi on, this is proton and this is k on. This is the picture for PP collisions and this is for gold gold and you will see that their slopes are different. Now, why that is happening? So, if the, so that was for fluid at rest. Now, if the fluid moves, that means on top of the thermal motion of the particles, there is now a collective velocity. Okay. If that is true, then your energy equation, now this term will, so this in this term it will have a velocity from thermal motion as well as a collective motion because that velocity will be same for all the particles. Now, the fluid is moving. So, that is moving with a uh, let us say constant collective velocity which is expected in the system formed in heavy ion collisions. Now, if that is true, you can write your energy in terms of this. Now, P t square you can express in terms of m t square like m t square minus m square. 
so your dpt by dmt is similar now if you want to see whether there is any difference in slope so you can take the slope of that spectra with respect to mt so this will give you the slope and you get this expression okay this is very easy you can differentiate and get this expression okay now what do you see here so can you tell me in terms of masses now for heavy particles let's say you take pi on for a certain pt you will have mt given by pt square plus m square okay pi on has a certain mass let's say you can take is at 140 now k on or proton which are heavier than pi ons what do you see for same pt what you will get or let's say for same mt what you will get pt values will be lower correct and in that sense this term in this expression will dominate and this will make or this will shift the spectrum to so this will make it more flat correct and this will be directly proportional to the mass of the particle so at similar pt you see the spectrum or the transverse momentum spectrum of identified particles in heavy ion collisions so it doesn't have a constant slope but depending upon the mass okay and you can see it from here depending upon the mass it becomes more flatter for let's say heavy particles so if you measure <clears throat> for lambda and other particles which are even heavier than proton they will have a flatter spectrum okay so this is a clear evidence of the onset of radial flow which is seen in heavy ion collisions okay and it's also clear evidence of fluid dynamics working in the system or the relativistic fluid dynamic evolution describing the system and we see that in data okay now this is a very recent data from alice experiment now here the bottom plot is again for pp so you can see that the slopes are although the comparison plot is not there you can see that the slopes are more or less similar now all the other color points are for heavy ions for three different particles now just concentrate on this low momentum region we'll come to that why we are concentrating on the low momentum region you see that as we move to higher centralities the spectra becomes the slope changes and the change is see here for pi on it is for k on them becoming flatter and for proton they are even more flatter than the k ons so you see a flat, gradual flattening of the spectra due to the onset of radial flow okay so this is a direct evidence of let's say hydrodynamics playing uh or coming into the picture of evolution of the uh phase created in heavy ion collisions now the third pointer is elliptic flow a very important parameter which we measure in uh, uh let's say data so let's talk about non central collisions non central collisions because you have a visible spatial anisotropy so the geometrical shape is like that of a ellipsoid or it's also known as almond shape now if that is true now we don't have a rotational symmetry here because those are non central collisions so because of the rotational symmetry you could really for because this is for central collisions you could really uh, write this dqp in terms of let's say px and py here okay once you have non central collisions that symmetry is now no more so px py you can write in terms of pt and d5 because we have seen that there will be a prefin preferential emission depending upon the direction of phi now if that is true now you can write your energy in terms of transverse mass u0 now earlier the phi dependence was not there but now this phi dependence comes in the velocity vector right so minus mt mu plus pt 
you and this is the transverse momentum spectra now if that is true earlier we have seen that this will have this preferential parametrization because of the difference in pressure gradients in the almond shape so you will have more velocity across the minor axis while less velocity across the major axis now if that is true you can write your u phi in terms of u plus 2 alpha cos 2 phi okay now this alpha is similar to your let's say flow coefficient we'll come to that what it is and then if you just plug in these equations u phi you also get the form for u0 and this will have this v component which is u by u0 and then you plug in all these two quantities here you can do this exercise not difficult and you compare it with our earlier assumption of the way we defined the flow coefficient uh, let's say that equation will be here yeah so this was our thing which is predicted by the onset of transverse expansion and if that is true you just compare those two expressions what you get your flow coefficient can be quantified this by this amount okay now if this is true okay this is coming from your hydrodynamic prediction of fluid dynamics now if this is true for light particles what you will get your mt is similar to your pt correct now if that is true your v2 increases linearly with pt right so you can just write in terms of in place of mt you just put pt then you will have a linear equation with respect to pt so for light particles like pions so v2 increases linearly with pt this is coming from prediction of hydrodynamics now for heavy particles mt is larger at some pt right at the same pt the mt would be larger because the expression of mt is <coughs> m square plus pt square so when the particle is heavy so for the same pt your mass will play a role so mt is larger at same pt so you will get a smaller v2 agreed so you will have different behavior for light particles and heavy particles so light particles will have a smaller v2 sorry your heavy particles will have a smaller v2 as per this equation and this is coming from your fluid dynamics so you should see a strong mass ordering at same pt so if you make a measurement of v2 for all the particles for all the identified particles which differ in their mass so you should see strong mass ordering that means the lighter particle should have higher values of v2 compared to heavier particles now if that is so uh let me just uh, time is not there so this is the experimental measurement of okay okay so this is the experimental measurement of v2 with respect to transverse momentum so this is the result from uh, star experiment at rick so if you see these are the pions then k short particle then uh, let's say proton and lambda so these particles differ in their masses and you can see that the mass ordering is followed now let me show a very uh, okay recent result from alice so here also for low pt region okay so we are talking about low pt region because at high pt regions this increase in pt is broken down due to several factors we'll talk about it uh, in the later lecture so here also you see so you have pions kaons and the blue particles are heavy particles and and all these there's a lot of measurement of identified particles and for this low pt you see a strong mass ordering and this is completely coming from ideal hydrodynamics okay so the take home message is that hydrodynamics is crucial in understanding of heavy and collisions at both rick and collider energies and inviscid hydrodynamics which i talked about because i am not taking into account any dissipative effects or viscosity in the fluid it's a ideal fluid it gives a satisfactory explanation of several rick and lhc data okay satisfactory because now when we try to see that it the agreement is at qualitative level 
all this mass ordering of empty spectra, differential elliptic flow, all these things we are observing in data, but they are not, I mean they are in sync with the predictions of let's say hydrodynamic evolution, but the quantitative agreement is not there. So now people are working on like including the viscous effects and all those things in this ideal hydrodynamics and then shifting to Navier-Stokes expression which takes care of the dis dissipative effects. So a lot of things are happening uh, uh, in this sector, a lot of theoretical uh, activity is seen in this sector to describe the experimental data. However, the idea of this session was to see that hydrodynamics is an effective theory to understand the evolution of this system from uh, let's say initial stage to final state. So we are getting various predictions given by hydrodynamics and we are seeing good experimental agreement or good experimental observables which agree to predictions of hydrodynamics. But how it is important in this EA collision because here we have electron interacting with A and then you have your particles produced. Now the idea is that you measure the V2 of those particles, you see the transverse momentum distribution of those particles in EA collisions and compare the behavior with what you have observed in heavy ion collisions. So the differences or the agreement will tell us about the effect of saturation physics on these observables. So the idea is to, you can make these measurements in EA collisions and you can, you can check or cross check with the expectations from what you have observed in let's say heavy ion collisions. So maybe you will have similar agreement or you will have differences which we are yet to see once the data comes but that will also give us an idea about how the saturation physics or the physics at that frontier really uh, shows its effect in uh, let's say hydrodynamic observables like V2, transverse spectra and all those things. So I would like to end here, thank you very much. Thank you Sagna, so there's time for a few questions before we go for lunch. So actually uh, I did not quite get the clear picture, so uh, you are applying the hydrodynamics to the QGP that is forming right? Yeah. So I mean, uh, if QGB is forming and then we have this deconfinement, so uh, why should it matter what uh, what we are colliding with? I mean, what we are starting with, we are, whether we are taking proton-proton collision or <coughs> because uh, anyway, after QGP is formed and it, uh, everything is deconfined, then uh, the after state should not uh, depend on what we have, right? The proton. Uh, after thermalization what we are starting with if we have proton proton or lambda lambda or what. Yeah, so what is the question? Yes, so uh, we are getting this different curves right mm. uh, depending on what collisions we are doing. Mm. So I mean uh, once we have, th uh, have this thermalization and stuff. Uh, so, the initial okay, so okay, so, so we started with the deconfined state and we want to see how it evolves, correct? So in proton proton collisions we are not sure that we are creating such a matter, okay. So it's better, it's always good to see those observables in basic collisions where you don't expect anything. So if you had seen similar behavior in proton-proton, okay, so where you don't expect such a system to be formed, like whatever we are seeing is that it's the same slope, okay, but that is not observed for lead-lead collisions. So something more is happening in case of that system which is not there in proton-proton collisions. Now another thing is that see the basic tenet is that assuming the local thermal equilibrium and it's really bizarre that I'll assume that in E collisions or proton-proton collisions, right? It's not possible that there's a system and it will equilibrate and I can let's say apply hydrodynamics to that, okay? But still you see for the proton-proton spectra and also you can see for the particles in E plus, E minus spectra, basically you can use these distributions to fit them. So that doesn't say that your equilibrated system is there. It only says that 
it's bizarre but you can say that okay it is statistical physics or the ensemble distribution that is coming into play but that doesn't mean that that the system is in equilibrium but while in case of lead lead collisions where you know that a system has been formed and you are assuming that system is interacting the particle the constituents are interacting among themselves strongly so that one can have a near equilibrium because this sort of scenario is not there in pp or e plus e minus collisions okay in that sense if it is moving with a velocity then you are seeing the differences then you think that okay it might come from the hydrodynamic behavior you are going to solve some differential equation you know what what is that equation or no, <coughs> no equation of state is not uh, so you you have an energy momentum tensor and you solve the energy momentum conservation equation del mu t mu nu equal to zero so any differential equation to solve you need initial conditions so it matters na what we collide otherwise the values that you get how do you compare to experiment so you need a set of initial conditions so you need to know what you collided yeah but uh, that's so in an experiment you are either colliding proton on proton or uh, nucleus on nucleus now what is proton made up of what is nucleus made up of the more accurately you can give you will get a better result which can be compared now this set of equations and observables are not same you have uh, more observables and uh, less number of equations so you need a equation of state to come in the relation between pressure and energy density you have to put in by hand which comes from uh, lattice calculations or hadron resonance gas calculations so that is one thing and then finally when will you stop your calculation so you need to know where up to how much time you will evolve these equations and you need to stop that also comes guidance comes from the experiment so initial conditions are important thank you uh, for the questions okay if not let us thank sadhana again and we go for lunch <laughs>